So one of the things when I was reading evolutionary psychology and, and trying to parcel out uh, you know, the differences in sexual attraction markers between men and women, I'll, I'll tell you a brief story as an intro to this. So when I was an undergraduate at the University of Alberta, um, I had, you know, I had some success with women, but not much. And then I went to McGill and I was a graduate student and nothing changed really in the cu couple of months between when I was a, you know, senior undergraduate at, in Alberta and when I was a low level graduate student in Montreal. But how attracted women were to me changed a lot. And I thought, well, that's not you. That's something about status. And I already knew that the evolutionary theory there and, you know, that women are more affected by, let's say, social status in relationship to sexual attractiveness than men are. But then I thought that through too, and I thought, no, no, women use status as a marker for the ability to gain status in novel environments. It's something like that. And so like an expensive watch or something like that, or a nice suit shows that you have acquired resources and hence that you still could, even if things fell apart. So it's, it's not mere power or even resources, which it's often parodied at and sometimes as and sometimes understood as it's a proximal marker for something much deeper, which is somewhat akin, I think, to what you're talking about with regards to the male bowerbird. Is that way off or? No, that's 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 very much the case. And I'll let you continue after Brett. But um, its status is exactly an honest indicator of the ability to have and presumably the ability to continue to procure resources. And frankly, this is a part of the sexual selection literature of how you know most evolutionary biologists would would have us discussing this that is quite unnerving and rather actually disrespectful because it imagines um, that female choice, that the females doing the choosing and all of these species, including usually humans, are just being frivolous. That they just, it, it, it doesn't matter. It ma it's, it's simply about status and what does status matter anyway? Whereas exactly what you've done here is tying it to the reality of how good a potential mate is going to be. And the answer to that is going to depend on whether or not your potential mate is going to be an active father or just, you know, provide gametes and then disappear. You know, what quality of mate, you know, what the qualities are that you're looking for will vary depending on what kind of creature you are. But the idea that females are just being frivolous. Well, that we can talk absurd. about status for a minute too. And so, like, if you look at so human social hierarchies, and this is true across the animal kingdom, and then you rank order individuals in terms of their relative status, even in relatively non social creatures that have to occupy the same territory, those that have the best local niches have offspring that are much more likely to survive. They have much lower mortality rates. And then there's something else too that, that, that psychologists have figured out that I think is right. that has a biological underpinning, which is that your serotonin system is more effective at modulating your negative emotion given as a certain level of stress the higher you up are, are up in a social hierarchy because you're actually safer and so that's and so part of what that implies and this just blew me away when i sorted it out was that when you go after someone's beliefs and they've used their beliefs to stake a claim to a position in a hierarchy you're attacking the structure that's that modulates their sensitivity to negative emotion mm. and and you know if you're hypersensitive to negative emotion you hyper prepare physiologically so much that you die way earlier so this isn't trivial and it isn't it isn't like the terror management theorists think that you know your beliefs somehow regulate your anxiety directly it's no you have a set of beliefs that gives you a stake to a claim in a status hierarchy and so that's what we do as professors right we say well well look we have this knowledge and that's why we get this niche well then you attack i attack the validity of your knowledge then i make you out to be one of those fly-in bowerbirds that just ripped off the status hierarchy and well and then that interferes with your emotional regulation that's like well that's worth thinking about for about 10 years that i think <laughs> yeah well i think uh one thing that is true is that our modern environment and our mismatch our evolutionary mismatch with it obscures all of the elaborate logic that undergirds the relationship of a normal creature and its environment or would have uh would have characterized our ancestors in any of the environments from which they came. And so it's very easy to look, for example, at, uh, you know, modern human females and see that there's a, 
uh, a preoccupation with the level of wealth and status of potential mates and to read something uh, superficial into it. But the point is, no, this is about deadly serious stuff, and it may not be deadly serious stuff in the modern environment. But the point is the sensitivity to those things has everything to do with females in a past environment uh, sussing out small differences that had large evolutionary implications for their lineage going forward. Well, and I think that your, your notion of niche transformation, niche switching there. So imagine that partly what the woman is trying to do is use markers of proximal success as an indicator of niche switching capacity. Now, they're in, they're in adequate markers, and, and that's partly why they can be criticized, you know, and, and it, they're no more accurate than the claim that just because you're rich, you're good. But it doesn't, but status is not exactly wealth, although wealth is a proxy for status, status is more subtle. And, but symbols of wealth are pretty good instantaneous proxies for status. Yeah, like they're subject to all sorts of flaws and they're not sufficient, but you know, <laughs> you have to screen most people out. So you need simple markers to begin with. So Heather, let me ask you, how do you view as a, both as someone who's female and someone who's an evolutionary biologist, how do you conceptualize the difference in status hierarchies in human females and human males? I'd really be interested to hear that. Yeah, well, this too could go on for 10 years. Um, we are one of very few species that has hierarchies in females and hierarchies in males. Other species tend to have one or the other. Um, there may be a, a couple, maybe Japanese macaques, if memory serves, that have both. But in those few species that have both and in all of the species that have one or the other, the hierarchies are created and maintained via different different means. And, you know, there's there's variation, of course, but in general, uh, the hierarchy in in males in other species and men in in humans is through overt means, through uh, fairly direct mm. claims. Sometimes it's physical, but usually the physicality is under the surface, right? It's, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's there as a possibility. Maybe you want to call it a threat, but usually things don't get physical as men are deciding um, what what the hierarchy actually is. But there's direct confrontation of a linguistic sort, of a gestural sort, of a, oh, you're doing that? I, I wouldn't do it that way. Or here, let me, you know, we're, we're That's together. That's often couched in a joke, too. Oh, and right. You know? And and so maybe that could be seen as sort of an end run around the direct provocation. But there's there's very rarely with with men. And, you know, maybe this is changing in modern times. But if if man A is uh, is interested in critiquing man B, he's very unlikely to say, I'm going to take this to man C first. I'm going to go talk to our joint friend. And before I take it directly to, to the guy in, in, um, who, with whom I have an issue. Whereas, um, so that's, you know, that tends to be overt and female hierarchies tend to be covert in nature. And, you know, this, this probably originates in part through the fact that even though we seem to be moving more and more towards a monogamous uh, mating system, and we are therefore losing our sexual dimorphism in humans, we still are sexually dimorphic and are still on average smaller and less muscular and less powerful. And so, you know, the, the ability to balance back up disagreement with the threat of physicality would have been less successful, certainly engaging with men, but also um, with, with other women. And so we're more likely, women are more likely to use social signals and covert signals and less direct signals to assess and to change what the hierarchy is. And there's a ton more to say, but maybe I'll leave it at that for the moment. So let's let's switch. You you have a chapter on sex and gender, and that would be fun to talk about. So first of all, I'm really curious about if you think those terms are importantly different, and if they are, why, and what they both mean if they're different. So let's start with that. All right. Um, they are different, but uh, the the way in which they relate actually uh, you can deduce from the omega principle which we haven't talked about yet but essentially the the way of conceptualizing it is uh heather and i say this slightly differently but i would say that gender is the software of sex and and i tend to say that gender is the behavioral manifestation of sex and what this means is that these things are housed at a different level 
What it does not mean mm -hmm. is that they are pointed towards different objectives. So the Omega principle, which is one of the important uh, uh, principles that undergirds the logic of the book, is that epigenetic phenomena, including culture and all of the software layer, is more flexible than genes and therefore more rapidly adopt, uh, adapting, but it is also subordinate to the genes in terms of objective because genes are in a perfect position to shut down anything behavioral or cognitive that does not serve their interests, which it won't do instantaneously, but over generations it will. So what we find is gender has to be serving the interests of the genes and therefore sex and gender should be pointed in the same direction. Now there's a lot of variation in the, the gender layer, but it is not a completely independent phenomenon. It is not superior to the underlying uh, genetics. Okay, so, so let me ask you about that in terms of personality then, because sure. I, I've been thinking a lot about the sex and gender issue, you know, the idea that there's an infinite number of genders. And, you know, I like to give the devil his due as much as I possibly can. And one of the things you do see in the personality literature in psychology, which is reasonably well-developed, right? I mean, we have a pretty good mo model of human personality, five basic personality traits. Maybe they're subdivisible into two sub-traits each, so that's 10. It's five dimensions of variability. That's a lot. Reality only has four dimensions of variability. So, so what you see is that there are reliable differences between men and women in aggregate in personality. And, and one of the big differences is that women are about half a standard deviation more sensitive to negative emotion. And they're about half a standard deviation more uh, agreeable, so more compassionate and polite. And you can, it's not that hard to point out that well, that might be a logical consequence of sexual dimorphism, so women should be a bit more sensitive to threat because they're a bit smaller, but also that they have to, I don't think human adult female personality is adapted to human adult females. I think it's adapted to female infant dyads. And a female infant, because here's why, you don't see those personality differences emerge till puberty. Now, that's also when you get sexual dimorphism, but boys and girls under 12, 11, they're not different in terms of sensitivity to negative emotion. But then puberty hits and the transformation seems permanent. And so it makes sense to me that a creature that has an infant is going to be more sensitive to negative emotion and also what has to be more agreeable, more compassionate, because, well, it's an infant, right? And compassion is the right emotion for someone under nine months of age. It's just compassion because, well, they're born so young, right? We, we have a very short gestation period, and so they're completely helpless. So, of course, it's compassion. Okay, so now having said those differences exist, and there's some other ones, but they're more trivial, there are lots of women who have male personality patterns, so you find women who are low in negative emotion and low in agreeableness. They're quite masculine that way. And there are men who are quite feminine in their personality characteristics. And, and then you could also say, well, insofar as personality is associated with gender, well, there is tremendous 10-dimensional variation. And so the idea that gender is fluid in some sense and that it's, you know, not exactly tied to the underlying sexual structure, there's some when it's not pushed too far, when it's not political in its intent, there's some validity to the claim. So what do you think about that biologically? Yeah, no, I think I think this is exactly right. I, I would, before I answer that, though, I would say that no woman who had ever uh, brought a child to term would claim that gestation was short in humans. But, yeah. <laughs> but I know I do know yeah. what you mean. I, I get your point. Um, but it feels interminable when you're actually <laughs> undergoing it. Um, with regard to sex versus gender and the sort of, you know, gender is 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 way more fluid than sex it is you know sex is binary we have you know we are a binarily sexually reproducing species with two and only two types of gametes the intermediate type of gamete which has a little bit of cytoplasm and kind of moves around a little bit you know a little bit eggy and a little bit spermy doesn't work there's lots of good reasons for this but the evolution of anisogamy the two different types of gametes is well understood from both a theoretical perspective and it just manifest right in in plants and animals right 
So that is true. Sex is binary. And then the expression, the software to use um, Brett's framing or the behavioral manifestation of, of sex to use mine. Of course, behavioral manifestation only works for animals. It doesn't work as well for, uh, for plants. But we, you know, we see the same kinds of sort of, I don't know, cultural behavioral manifestation of sex, even in plants, even with regard to eggs being more choosy than pollen in in plants with regard to who to mate with. So, of course, there will be a greater manifestation of ways to engage the world when you're talking about, say, the behavioral manifestation of what your underlying sex is than there will be uh, for you know, what your actual sex is. 